Welcome to Deconstructing Calvinism, episode 21. This is brought to you by Mission 119 Ministries. My name is Hudson Smelly, and the title of this episode is Pillar Proof Text, James chapter 2, verse 14. In this series, we typically either explain Calvinism or we address a claim of Calvinism and refute it either based on exegesis, historical considerations, or philosophical considerations. The goal of this episode is to exegete James 2.14, which separate and apart from anything to do with Calvinism is an important endeavor because this is a verse that a lot of folks misunderstand. But it's also a pillar proof text for the tulip doctrine of perseverance of the saints. If that's an unfamiliar term to you, that is the perseverance, uh, go and take a look or listen to the prior episode, episode 20, and this is covered in some detail from the Calvinist uh, writer's perspective. But in essence, it is the doctrine that if you're truly saved, you will continue in fruitfulness to the end of your life. A protracted uh, failure to do so or uh, you know, a consistent sin in your life means that you're going to hell. Uh, that's that's the uh, traditional doctrine, which is to be distinguished from preservation of the saints or eternal security, with which uh, I fully uh, agree. Now, when we look at uh, a proof text exegetically, we need to measure the proof text or text against every element of the truth proposition that they're being offered to prove. You would look, for example, at the various pieces of perseverance of the saints and ask which, if any of those, are demonstrated by James 2.14. We have to focus on context, the flow of the argument of the book, and the structure of the book. We don't simply isolate a proof text and look at it through a straw. We ask questions like, how does the tulip interpretation make sense, not only of the immediate context, but the larger argument and structure of the book? It's so critical. I give an easy example that I use a lot. Paul addresses the matter of justification, our by-faith righteousness, in Romans 3 and 4. He talks about how you become a Christian, that you can't do it on your own, uh, but you simply receive by faith the righteousness that's provided, the justification that's provided uh, by what Jesus did on the cross. But some people add an additional element to the faith. They say, well, you've also got to recite some kind of sinner's prayer, and they usually get that from Romans 10. Why on earth would Paul not have included that critical element in his discourse on justification in Romans 3 and 4, but instead sort of hide it on the, on the back side of the page uh, in, in, in Romans 10, which is addressing a, a different issue altogether. So structure matters. We ask ourselves, why would someone uh, stop in the middle of a discussion on a particular topic to switch gears, say something about Calvinism, and then move back to the topic again? And of course, they wouldn't do that. So we also have to properly define uh, key words. Uh, we use lexicons. Those are like dictionaries, but they'll have uh, the Greek or the Hebrew word with a definition in English, those are the ways the, the reader or the hearer back in the day would have understood these words. Now, words may have several meanings, but what we can't do is make up fake definitions and in particular front load our theology into a definition so that we ensure that we get it out of the verse. We don't want to do that. That's circular. So James 2.14 is the pillar proof text. And as I said, uh, you can't deal with it in isolation, but I want to take a good look at it uh, first and, and make some preliminary comments. Uh, James says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters or my brethren? He addresses them as Christians. He assumes they're Christians. What good is it, you know, my fellow uh, brethren, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works, can such faith save him? Uh, the verse is offered as a primary proof text that so-called saving faith must generate good works. How much good works is enough to tip the scale in your favor is never stated in the Bible. But those good works must continue throughout your life. If the faith does not produce good works, then it was not saving faith. It was an empty faith, a dead faith, and that person goes uh, to hell. So we want to see a couple of interpretations of James 2.14 in the Calvinist own words. Understand that they're not simply saying that faith must produce some work. Uh, they use this as the basis for uh, the idea that saving faith 
will produce a lifetime of, of good works. So R.C. Sproul on James 2.14 says, and I'm just quoting uh, from his writing, uh, James is asking what kind of faith is saving faith. He makes it clear that no one is justified by a mere profession of faith. Anyone can say he has faith, but saying it and having it are not the same thing. True faith always manifests itself in works. If no works follow from faith, then the alleged faith is dead and useless. Abraham demonstrated his faith by his works. He showed he had true faith, just uh, thus justifying his claim to faith. Abraham's profession of faith is vindicated in his demonstration of his faith in Genesis 22. At issue here is the question of genuine faith. Reformers taught that justification is by faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. True faith is never alone. And that's the end of the quote. Uh, John MacArthur uh, offers similar, um, uh, a similar interpretation. He says the question, can that faith save him? is not offered to dispute the importance of faith, but to oppose the idea that just any kind of faith can save. Uh, compare Matthew 7, 16 to 18. The grammatical form of the question calls for a negative answer. No, it cannot save. A profession of faith that is devoid of righteous works cannot save a person no matter how strongly it may be proclaimed. As already noted, it's not that some amount of good works added to true faith can save a person but rather that faith that is genuine and saving will inevitably produce good works. So we'll take a look at this and see if um, James 2.14 gets you to where uh, Mr. Sproul and MacArthur um, are in their views. Um, you can't start in 2.14, as I said earlier, and, and I don't have time for a deep dive through everything that precedes it, but I do want to hit it at a high level and encourage you to make that deeper dive, and I'll even uh, suggest a, a resource at the end if you've never uh, done a deep dive through James and you want a you know a help to or commentary to look at as you as you work your way through it. But the uh, organization of James is the first eighteen verses are prologue. He opens up talking about the trials that face uh, the believers he's writing to. Uh, he never suggests in any way that he's not writing to believers, and in fact, 19 times calls them brethren or brothers or brothers and sisters, depending on your, your translation. And he does this again in, in James 1, verse, verse 19. But after those first 18 verses of the prologue uh, on suffering and, and how we deal with suffering and how God uses trials as, and suffering to grow us, uh, he turns to the main body of his epistle, and he has this thematic statement. You can organize the whole book around what he says in verse 19. You know, my dear brothers and sisters, my fellow Christians, understand this. Everyone should be quick to listen. That's part one to his book, in a sense. Slow to speak, part two, and slow to anger. That's part three. And I'll show you a chart on the next page for this. And then I, I wanted to include verses 20 and 21. Verse 20 just adds that you know human anger doesn't accomplish God's righteousness. That relates back to what he said about being slow to anger. And then verse 21 is, is the verse, I would argue, it starts with a therefore, and it begins his first major section, which is on this matter of being quick to listen. He's not saying have good listening skills, be a good listener. That's a good uh, bit of advice for all of us when, when we're speaking to people to be good listeners to what they have to say. He's talking about being a person who is quick to listen to what God says, to listen to God's word, and then slow to speak and slow to anger. So he says, therefore, ridding yourselves of all moral filth and evil that's so prevalent, and just pause there, non-Christians can't do that. He speaks to them as Christians, people that are indwelled of the Holy Spirit who have the ability uh, to do this. And he says, rid yourselves of all moral filth and evil that's so prevalent. Humbly receive the implanted word which is able to save your souls. And we're going to unpack that a little more because that is his summary statement for the section. That's what he wants to talk about. What it means to humbly receive the implanted word which is able to save your souls. And he takes that up from verse 21 through the end of chapter 2. In verse 214, our proof text is right in the middle of it. and You can't extricate it from this context. This is his goal. He is speaking to Christians about setting aside uh, moral filth and evil and humbly receiving the implanted word, which he'll make clear is not merely being able to know it or memorize it or even believe it, 
but it's it's another step on top of that the word of god is always to be experientially known and he uses the imagery of receiving a seed like the words a seed that gets planted in the soul of your heart and then it grows and bears fruit with the result it's able to save your souls and this matter of saving the souls again i'll come say more about that but this is where the whole thing breaks down because people tend to read save to mean a certain thing without uh, you know really establishing from context that's what it means and the same thing with the word soul so here's just a little chart showing a high level organization of james from as i said earlier the introductions the first 18 verses and then he gives that thematic statement in verse 19 introducing the concept of being quick to listen to god's word slow to speak and, and slow to wrath or anger and he will address slow to listen or quick to listen rather uh, through the end of chapter 2 verse uh, 26 there and and really you could argue that chapter 3 verse 1 is, you know goes with quick to listen it's sort of a a segue uh, to what he says throughout chapter 3 about controlling our tongue or our speech and then in chapter 4 in the early part of chapter 5 he deals with this matter of of Christians being angry and, and wrathful and that sort of thing so this book is not a book about how to become a Christian uh, this book is how Christians ought to live and in particular is is step one they need to be quick to listen to God's Word to humbly receive God's Word which is able to save their souls and um, he'll deal with the idea first of the humbly receiving the word and the idea second of what it means to save your soul in that order and so he's going to address them one two uh, through the balance here uh, 122 through about 2 8 or, or you know you might argue through 2 11 depending how you view it but he's going to deal with this matter of receiving the word being a doer of the word and then later uh, this matter of a judgment on our faithfulness so uh, a quick note about save save doesn't always have anything to do with being saved from p the penalty of sin or saved from hell we use church lingo somebody saved or they're not saved as if the bible always speaks that way and it almost never speaks that way uh, in the sense in which we often use it it sometimes does but the word save is a very generic term and context has to determine what somebody's being saved from or delivered from because in you know like i said in a church context we tend to use it in a narrow way and then we might take that more narrow understanding and put it into a text just because it has the word save it's got to be driven by context and so if we just carelessly assume anytime we see a verse like james 121 that speaks of the word save that he's talking about making sure folks make their way to heaven we're going to get a lot of bad doctrine out of that um, in fact this greek verb sozo and the related noun for salvation soteria more often than not so you know, like 52 53 percent of the time are not about being delivered from penalty of sin or hell and just some quick examples i'm not going to belabor these but you can look through and read these different uh, uh text uh, but as said, more than half the time, save or saved is a, a, a term, a generic term for being um, delivered or rescued. And it doesn't even have to be from peril or something bad. So you do have delivered from the penalty of sin as one use, delivered from illness when someone's healed. You won't see it in the English text because Jesus says, you know, I've made you whole. But the word there is I saved you or rescued you. And it has nothing to do with that person going to heaven. It's their healing. Um, saved from sleep or delivered from sleep this is just people waking up so this isn't a negative thing it's just someone is woken out of out of their slumber that same word is used uh, saved from a temporal judgment save yourselves from this untoward generation acts 240 saved from a uh, bondage in Egypt when God pulled the slaves out of there Stephen refers to that in his acts uh, his sermon in Acts 7 that they were saved from Egypt it has nothing to do with with heaven or hell it just has to do with being taken away you know uh, away from where they were captive paul talks in a few places about being saved from drowning in acts 27 which is again uh, it's a physical saving uh, so that they don't die but nothing nothing so terrible about it and then saved from prison you know escaped out of prison paul talks about uh thing you know believing in, in philippians 1 that he will be delivered through their prayer the philippians prayer uh, from prison so we also have this word soul and this is another one where we have an english usage of soul that almost always has to do with the spirit 
and we write that into the text and it's not there. Greek has a different word for spirit. It's pneuma, and if the writer wants to say spirit, that's generally how it's going to be. Uh, in Dave Anderson's book, uh, Free Grace Soteriology, excellent book, by the way, it's on a second or third edition now. Uh, he talks about the word soul and how it has four different uses. The Greek word is suke. We get the English word psychology from it. The word suke is used about 104 times in the New Testament in four primary ways. And he writes that only a handful of the 104 uses refer to the immaterial part of man, what we would call the spirit, that enjoys or suffers, uh, you know, enjoys heaven or suffers in hell. Most of the time, the word refers either to our time on earth, and he puts in parentheses, our life, or to our inner self as a unique combination of mind, emotions, and will. This idea of our life, okay, in the sense in which we might say someone's life was well lived, uh, they really lived a good, solid Christian life. We're using life in the sense of suke, the soul. That's what it's about. And uh, Harry Leaf, who was a mentor of mine, um, uh, and, and has an excellent book on the, uh, an issue we're going to touch on in a moment here about this matter of rewards, uh, the Bema judgment for Christians. Uh, Harry Leaf explained that in the context of James 20, 121, Suke, quote, describes the whole of a person's life and can be defined as the total temporal expression of human life. And uh, that's exactly what's going to be going on here. Let me show you an example real quick that both illustrates this matter of the idea of a soul being your life, not merely the matter of being alive. That would be a different word. There's a couple of words for life in the sense of just being alive, zoe and bios and stuff. But but in Greek, the word soul, um, it, it's often translated as life, as it is in this passage from Matthew 16. And, and the idea is the sum and substance of your life, the things you've done and experienced and, and said and that sort of thing. Uh, you can have a life well lived for God and a life that's uh, not really lived for God and a life that's somewhere in the middle. And and that is the, I mean, far and away the most common use of the word soul. And so people will talk so often about evangelism or saving souls. Uh, th there is a sense to that, but what they mean and what I mean if I said save a soul isn't the same. Um, Jesus talks here about saving a soul. Uh, Matthew 16 is the, the passage where, you know, he famously uh, asked what you know who people think he is, and uh, Peter gives a profession of faith. You're the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus, Jesus talks about building his church on this rock, and then he you know speaks just to his disciples. So he he there is disciples already. He doesn't need to evangelize them and teach them how to go to heaven. And people look at this passage and say, "Yep, this is what you got to do to go to go to heaven." If you wanted to say that, he'd say that. He doesn't say this is what you do to go to heaven. He says this is what you do to get a reward. And so just look at the text. If anyone wants to follow after me, that's not uh, becoming a Christian. That's being a disciple. That's in the first century. It was literally following after him during his earthly ministry. He says, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his, and I'm going to read soul life, because that's the word here. Whoever wants to save his soul life will lose it, but whoever loses his soul life because of me will find it. What he's talking about, this isn't a paradox. You can live rich toward God or not or somewhere in the middle. He's calling on people who are going to be disciples. You want to be a disciple? You need to follow me. You're setting aside the life you might have lived for a life that is all about following Jesus. So you're denying yourself and you're following him. And in that sense, those who would save their life, save the part where they, they would live for themselves, they'll ultimately lose it because that will never transcend the grave. On the other hand, if you set that aside, that's the losing your soul life. If you set aside your agenda, your priorities, what you might have done uh, with your life because you've made a decision to be a disciple of Christ in the truest sense of the word, and you're going to follow after him and put his priorities first, he says, you, you lose your life because of me, but you'll find it. And, and the question, of course, becomes in what way and, and when. The life you're going to live, the soul life you're going to live now, is one that's rich toward God. It's in pursuit of Christ. And that one, uh, you're going to find it or keep it. It's not going to end at the grave the way the other soul life would have. And he gives a couple of, of rhetorical type questions to illustrate. He says, what will it benefit? And he's talking about, 
is if you can earn something, uh, receive something in, 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 you know, in relation to what you do, this isn't about believing on Christ. This is about something different. What would it benefit you, hypothetically, if you could gain everything the world has? Okay, that's the life a lot of us just left to our own nature. That might be what we would pick. Uh, we would we would have the good life in the worldly sense of that word. What if you can have the ultimate good life? You can have everything, and and yet you lose your soul life because what happens? Uh, you want to be a disciple. You're going to live out the soul life Christ has for you in pursuit of Him, not the one you would have done. The one you would have done that terminates at the grave. That's just worldly stuff. It all ends at the grave. What what does it benefit you if you gain everything and lose it all? Okay. Or what would someone give in exchange for his soul life? What would you give so that your soul life, the sum and substance of all your thoughts, words, and actions, everything you do, would transcend the grave? The Son of Man is going to return with his angels in the glory of his Father, and he will reward each according to what he's done. Now, that's true of believers and non-believers. But non-believers stand at the great white throne judgment to account for their sin, and they get dispatched to the lake of fire. It's, it's the believers, and, and this is not with a view to heaven or hell. It's with a view to someone who was a disciple. They were willing to lose their life to find it in the, because they're pursuing a Christ, and, and they're the ones that are going to receive this reward. And in that sense, their soul life transcends this mortal time and goes into the kingdom, into eternity, because of this reward. He doesn't say what well, the rewards are, but we, we, we expect them to be good. So with that in mind, that, that when, when James says in 1, uh, twenty one that if you'll humbly receive the word of God, uh, it, it, you know, you will, it, it'll save your soul. Um, we need to hold, say, well, wait a second, you know, save doesn't have to be heaven or hell. It can be a different kind of deliverance and, and soul, that that's about your life it can save your life his point is somehow this word of god humbly received will save your soul life and and then he goes into this matter of being a doer of the word and not a hearer only i've got the verses chapter 1 verse 22 to 27 uh, i'm not going to go through all this these are familiar passages we've heard it over and over but i don't know if we've always rightly connected it to our proof text in james 2:14 but he says, be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. To humbly receive God's implanted word, let it be like a seed in the soul of your heart that then takes root and flourishes. Uh, it's, it's not merely to be a hearer, which would be someone who's literally heard and, and perhaps believed. I, I, I think the indication here, because he's talking to Christians, they think it's true, but they haven't received it as, as the implanted word that then gives fruit that you that you see it gives a growth or a flourishing that you see because they live it out he says if you're if you're a hearer but not a doer you know you're deceiving yourself what in in, in relation to what well, he's going to get there because um you, you don't want to be standing before christ giving account for yourself and and have nothing to show for it because you knew lots of bible but you just you just didn't give give it serious attention between you know in general to, to live it out and, and he also, you know, he's talking about the Word of God in general, but he will focus in, beginning in verse 25, on a specific part of the Word of God. And it's, it's called the perfect law of freedom. Some translations say the law of liberty. And also in chapter 2, it's going to be called the royal law. And it's going to be identified specifically in chapter 2, verse 8. It's to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said this fulfills all the righteousness of the law. Love your neighbor as yourself. He even in John says, I'm giving you a new commandment. Love others as I've loved you, he says. So this perfect law of freedom uh, is a good litmus for what it is to be a, a person who's quick to hear God's word, who's humbly received it. Because if you've humbly received it, you not only believe that you should love your neighbor, you're going to actually love your neighbor. This isn't about whether you believe the gospel, trusted in, 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 in Christ for the forgiveness of sins. This is about the faithfulness of a Christian. Now, now that you've put, put your trust in Christ, what's next? We well, you know what? He said, love your neighbor. Are you doing that? And he gives the easy example in verse 26 and 27 of taking care of widows and orphans. That's what you do 
if you love your neighbor as yourself. You take care of widows and orphans. You're a doer, not a hearer only. Chapter 2 continues this, and he uses the illustration of people within a local church showing favoritism toward Christians who either have money and in a lack of, of uh, you know, they're not kind to the ones who don't have money. He says that's a failure to be a doer of the word. It's a violation of the royal law or the perfect law of liberty to show that kind of favoritism. And he says, God doesn't show that kind of favoritism. Why would you? Verse 8, if indeed you fulfill the royal law prescribed in the scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. Um, he shouldn't. You shouldn't be seeing this kind of favoritism in the, in the church. And uh, as he continues, and I, I skipped a few verses. Again, I'm not trying to cover them all, but I wanted to set up that the material leading up to James 2.14 is all about this matter of a, a person who he's already uh, sp speaking to as a Christian, recognized them as a Christian, even told them that because of you know they're Christians, you know they're going to have some trials, but God's going to use those trials to to grow them, and that they can pray to God for wisdom during the trials. I mean, everything about this, he believes he's writing to to Christians, and he, he never questions that. Uh, and, and now the focus is on this matter of humbly receiving God's word because it's able to save your soul. He needs to explain what it means to humbly receive the word. It's not hard. You're going to be a doer, not a hearer only. Then you got to talk about, well, what does it mean to save your soul life? Remember, that's not your spirit. It's your life. In what way can the Christian save their life? Everything you've thought, done, and 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 uh, you know during this mortal life and everything you've spoken, like in what sense could that be delivered, be be saved or rescued in some way. And so uh, James 2 brings us to the fact that, you know, and, and I'm sure his, his readers already knew this. This wasn't brand new stuff, but he's putting it in black and white for them. He says, you know, you need, in, in, in light of the rule of law, to love your neighbor as yourself, you need to talk and you need to behave or act as those who are going to be judged by that law he calls the law of freedom or the law of liberty here. He also called it the rule law. Uh, for judgment is without mercy, the one who's not shown mercy, but mercy triumphs over judgment. Uh, this is not a judgment in a, in a punitive or negative sense. We shouldn't write that into the word judgment. It just means a determination. It, it doesn't have a positive or negative with it unless the context shows that. And and what he's, he's saying is uh, to his, his Christian brethren, this matter of being a, a doer, not a hearer only, this is serious business. We're going to give an account. Now, I read where Jesus taught about him coming and rewarding faithfulness from Matthew 16. Most of the New Testament writers write about this, and I don't have time here because I think it would add another you know, 30 or 45 minutes to go through them. But some Christians are not familiar with these passages that talk about a judgment for Christians uh, they always think a judgment is punitive, and, and it's not, but there's a, a judgment in a positive sense for Christians where we give an account of ourselves. It's with a view to Jesus giving us approval and commendation and, and, and honor for a life well lived, for our faithfulness. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, we'll all give an account to our, uh, of ourselves. Romans 14 says the same thing. We're all going to give an account of ourselves, talking to fellow Christians. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, uh, starting around verse 10 or 11, has a, a fairly extensive passage that talks about how our works as Christians will be, in a sense, tested by fire. It's a metaphor, but uh, it can be gold, silver, precious stones. That's living in a way that's rich toward God. You test it by fire, and it's still going to be there. Or you, 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 could, you could live a life that's wood, hay, and stubble, and you test it by fire, and it burns up. And so it has no permanence. And that's what Jesus was talking about, about choosing one soul life or the other to live. One has permanence because it goes beyond the grave. You're going to get rewarded. You lose it to keep it. But you choose the other life, the wood, hay, and stubble. You keep something. You're trying to hold on to something, a, a, a worldly agenda for your life that you can't really keep. And so you lose it at the, at the, at the grave. And, and several other passages. First uh, Peter and his prologue, the first nine verses, talks about this. Uh, and he uses the word in inheritance. Paul uses the word reward in 1 Corinthians 3. Uh, Philippians chapter 4 talks about their gift to Paul um, going to their heavenly account. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, don't store up treasure on earth where it, it's, it's temporary and it gets destroyed and stolen, but store up treasure in heaven where your heart is, there your, you know, where, your, where your treasure is, where your heart will be also. He's talking about heavenly-minded people 
living a life that stores up a reward or inheritance, their treasure in heaven. And, and James is one of the many writers in the New Testament that, that puts our conduct through, through the lens of, hey, you're going to give an account for Christ. This is serious business. Not about going to purgatory or hell, but don't you want to stand before Jesus and have a life well lived where he says, well done, where he commends a life well lived, and, and perhaps there's some kind of other rewards uh, attached uh, to that. Uh, in 1 Peter 5, there's a reference to uh, elders uh, receiving a reward at this time that he calls a crown of glory, a Stephanos of glory, which was a, a prize given to people in the uh, the games for for a, a, you know a, a good race or whatever. But he talks about an elder of a church, uh, you know, having been faithful to their task, and and then when they stand before Jesus, he gives them a reward. So here we are, and and he's telling us in James 2:13, 12 and 13 essentially what Paul and Peter and the others said about standing before Christ and giving account for ourselves. And the standard here isn't whether you've trusted uh, Christ uh, as your Savior, because that's not an issue in the whole book of James. He's talking about uh, Christians living out their Christian life in a way that pleases Christ. And so the standard is, uh, unsurprisingly, you know, that it's going to be the royal law, the law of liberty. Did you love your neighbor as yourself? Because you can pull all the righteousness of God through that. Um, and and after saying that, then you get the proof text that's that's appealed to uh, James 2.14. Now, I've colored this text in yellow and blue just to show a high-level organization of the balance of the, the unit of thought. Up to, up to James 2.12, he was focused on what it means to be a doer, you know, to, to receive the word humbly and you're a doer, not a hearer only. Now he's talking about uh, standing before Christ, giving account to yourselves, what Paul would call both in um, 2 Corinthians and in Romans 14, the, the Bema. And so some people call this the Bema judgment or the Bema seat of Christ. And that's a good word for it because the word Paul uses uh, in, in those passages. So now he's going to talk about it, this Bema judgment, this Bema seat, right? What's going to happen? And what you see is the material before and after 2.14 is all about the same thing, this law of freedom or royal law being lived out. In fact, in, in uh, verses 15 and 16 and 17, you see an example of Christians who are in need, and he's saying if you're a hearer and not a doer, right, you're going you're gonna to meet their need if you, if you can. But I've colored the yellow parts because they're what we call inclusios. That's a literary device where a unit of thought uh, begins and ends with with a particular thought, usually very identical language, and then the middle, it, it supports that idea. He begins in verse uh, 15 and ends in 17. Uh, I'm sorry, begins in 14 and ends in 17 with what I call a faith works inclusio. For James, speaking to an audience of Christians, he wants them to think of faith and works as being intertwined because, uh, you know, as a Christian, you don't have the Word of God just to have some academic knowledge. Uh, you, you, this is serious business. You're supposed to live out your faith, and you're going to stand before Christ one day and answer for it. And and so he, he links works and, and faith in that way. And verse 14 and verse 17 both mention works and faith, and, and it's an inclusio, and so is 20 through 26. Verse 20 and verse 26 also mention works and and faith together and and within those two short paragraphs uh, you have him giving some support uh for for this matter of the link between works and faith in the life of a christian okay and in faith here uh well, well we'll say more about that in a minute and then in the blue i have something called a diatribe we'll come back to that but he sandwiches the diatribe between the two inclusios now we have to ask some questions here to understand James 2.14. We've got some context built up at this point. Questions, what's the frame of reference when he says, what good is it? He's, well, the obvious frame of reference is what good is it at this judgment in, in verse 12 and 13? What good is it at that judgment uh, if you have faith and you don't have works? Uh, second thing, what is the content of the faith? You can't read this and say, just because it has the word faith, a word that simply means um, to, to believe, right? Uh, just because you have faith to believe as a verb or as, an, as a noun, it's it's you know a belief. Just because you have that uh, doesn't mean that it has anything to do with heaven or hell of standing in the balance. 
faith always has content. The question is, in this context, what is it that is believed? Okay, what is it that the faith is in? And to say, well, it's got to be about the gospel, like like Sproul and MacArthur. You know, the issue here is saving faith. The gospel's not even in the crosshairs here. It's the royal law. He's using that as is a is such an easy way to illustrate and, and and provide his instruction on what it means to humbly receive the word of God as the implanted word that's able to save your souls. Okay, it's able to save your lives. And he uses the example, love your neighbors yourself. What good is it if someone claims to believe you should love your neighbor as yourself, but he doesn't actually love his neighbor? Can that kind of belief save him? A belief that is totally uh, separated from being a doer of the royal law? Well, of course it can't save him. But the question, and I put it here, save from what? Is this save in the sense of justification? If it is, then you can't rectify James with Romans. James teaches that you're saved by works, and in and, and Romans uh, 3 and 4 says you're not. But um, there's no reason in this context to take the saving to be anything about heaven or hell. You take it to be saving or deliverance. Remember, that's a very fluid term. Uh, it doesn't even have to be a rescue from peril. It can simply be waking somebody up, right? So what's the saving? What's the question? What good is it? What does it have to do with? It's relating right back to the judgment of 12 and 13. Um, James probably had Matthew 16 in mind, but it reflects the thinking of Matthew 16 and numerous passages that I've quickly alluded to in the writings of Paul and, and Peter about the matter of Christians uh, giving an account of themselves. Jesus was fond of teaching parables about this, parables where he gives his servant some minas, and then he goes on a long journey and comes back, and he Ask them to come and give a testimony showing their faithfulness, right? And he rewards those that are faithful. Uh, this is just not a, a surprise for us. And and that that is a judgment, uh, a determination of our faithfulness that is wholly about works, okay? Because your, your sin issue, that was dealt with at the cross. It was dealt with the moment you placed in your faith in Christ. You were justified, sealed, all that's done. There's no reason to have that discussion here uh, in a letter to believers. The discussion is, what about when you stand at the Bama judgment? Is faith alone going to be enough there? And it's not. It is faith with the works that will save a soul in the sense of having a life, a soul life, that transcends into eternity with, with Jesus. Instead of it all just burning up at the, at the grave and being done and over with, Jesus commending, uh, giving some honor and glory uh, to you and perhaps other kinds of rewards like authority in the kingdom, things that are spoken of elsewhere. So uh, we have to answer these questions. And, and, and in light of the fact that he's talking about the royal law of loving your neighbor as yourself before and after James 2.14, we have to understand this isn't about salvation unless salvation is wholly about works. This is about um, uh, the Christian life being assessed at the Bama Judgment. Now, we'll go on a little further because I want to show that there's nothing after James 2.14 that would change uh, the thought here. What is a diatribe? It's a literary device that anticipates a hypothetical or objection, uh, objection or response to an argument. The author, the writer, will uh, introduce the uh, diatribe, and this is you know based on a study of ancient uh, literature, um, you know, I've pulled this from scholarly sources. I don't have the sites all here, but I, I do reference them in my, my book on James. But uh, they always follow the same pattern, and you, you're not at liberty to ignore it or pretend it's not there. Uh, James uses a diatribe, pure and simple, and, and people butcher this passage up by, by failing to recognize something that was obvious to the hearer in the first century because it was such a common device. I'm not going to go through it, but I've shown you here on the same slide two examples of Paul using the diatribe that follows this formula of raising a hypothetical or objection or response to an argument. The objector that's purely hypothetical is called an interlocutor. They always introduce it by saying, someone will say, or a person will say, or you might say to me, right? They set up, somebody might raise their hand with an objection. Then, then they lay out the objection or a response or commentary, whatever it is the objector is saying. And then they signal the beginning of their retort 
with a pejorative. It's real common. Oh, vain man. Oh, empty man. You fool. That kind of thing. You senseless person. You see exactly that here. Verse 18 says, someone will say. See, they're raising a hypothetical objection. And verse 20 says, senseless person, indicating he's fixing to respond. People take the words from 18 and, and 19 and attribute them to James. It's like quoting Job's friends or the Pharisees for your theology. This is the hypothetical objector who is saying that James is wrong, and James introduces his retort at the end of the uh, at the end of the diatribe with the phrase senseless person in verse 20. So when someone says, James said, I'll show you my you know, faith by my works. The objector said that. The objector is saying, you know what? Faith and works aren't intricately tied for the Christian the way you're saying. You know, you can have faith without works, faith by works. It, it's, you know, they don't have to go together for the Christian. And and, and then, he, and then uh, the, the interlocutor gives uh, an objection that, you know, an illustration really that, that no a Christian writer anywhere has ever even suggested. It's only here in all the Bible, the very idea that the demons believe. And, and people will say, well, you know, the demons believe, and by implication, they're saying the gospel. That's not what they believe. Verse 19 is the Shema from Deuteronomy 6, just a short part of it. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. He's just saying the demons believe there's one God. This has nothing to do with the gospel because it has nothing to do with salvation. Because nothing in the whole passage has anything to do with saving sinners or saving demons from hell. Uh, this has to do with whether you believe God's word and live it out. And the objector reflects an understanding of it that way. That's why he doesn't go to the gospel. He says, you know, uh, you, James, you, verse 19, you believe the Shema. You believe there's one God, monotheism. That's good. But you know the demons believe there's one God as well, and, and they don't respond with any kind of, of good works or, or, or whatever. You know, they just shudder, right? And, and so, uh, and James says, you senseless person. He rejects the whole thing, okay? And, and what he's rejecting is, the idea that faith and works just really aren't tied, you know, uh, faith for one person does one thing, faith for another. But the reader realizes the absurdity of the argument because n no Jewish Christian, that's his audience, would ever talk in terms of the demons believing God's word and acting on it. It's, it's meant to have a shock factor to it. And that's why he has the strong pejorative, you, you senseless person. And, and he follows this with examples from the life, in a second, faith works in Clusio, the life of Abraham and the life of Rahab. You know, Paul goes on at length in Romans 3 and 4 to say that we're justified by faith. And, and it has the sense of us being declared righteous by faith. And, and then uh, James talks about Abraham being justified by works. And people say, well, there's a contradiction. Justified doesn't mean declared righteous. That's the problem. That's a theological definition, and I think it fits Romans 3 and 4, where the argument is that apart from Christ, we're all under sin. We're under its dominion, and we can't do a thing to fix it. All we can do is, by faith, receive the righteousness of God on the basis of Jesus' finished work at Calvary, and, and that's by faith righteousness, what Paul calls justification. We've been declared righteous, not because we're really righteous, but because uh, all of our sins were dealt with by Christ. Justification, justified, is a, is a more generic word. It means to vindicate or give a favorable verdict. Uh, it can be used in all sorts of contexts. It has nothing to do with salvation in the sense we usually think of it. It has nothing to do with heaven or hell. And, and the word just standing alone all by its own self doesn't mean declared righteous. In the context of Romans 3 or 4, that's the sense of it. Declared a verdict, okay, a proper or good result, a favorable verdict of righteousness. So it has that sense there. Uh, when we come to James, that's not the issue. He's not talking about people being justified in that sense that Paul was. He's talking about something completely different. Abraham, and, and James quotes it, Abraham was, according to Paul and James, uh, in Genesis 15, 6, he was justified back in Gen uh, Genesis 15. Uh, God said some things to him, some promises. He believed God, especially about having a child, and it was credited to him as righteousness. That's the justification of Romans 3 and 4. The justification that, that James is talking about several decades later, when Abraham 
illustrates what it means to be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Even when he got the word that he was to take his own son's life, he was a doer of the word and not a hearer only. He was vindicated. He got a favorable verdict of his faithfulness to God as someone who's already a believer. And that's the issue throughout the passage. Christian's faithfulness to God's word, receiving it as the implanted word, which is able to save your soul life. Rahab's another example. She didn't know a lot about God, but she had heard things and she believed that the God that freed these people out of Egypt was the real and true God and he had brought them over the Jordan River and, and all that. And, and, and so she saves the spies. Her faithfulness is vindicated. It gets a favorable verdict. Her faithfulness as a believer gets a favorable verdict by her receiving and protecting the spies. Well, in summary, the Calvinist doctrine of perseverance of the saints is that the Bible teaches that those who are truly and genuinely saved or justified will persist in faithfulness until the end of their lives. Uh, James 2.14 is really not about fake believers, professors that are not possessors, or people who thought they were Christians, but they're being dispatched to hell for lack of sufficient works. He calls his readers brethren uh, over and again, and if he doubted, if he ever doubted their justification in the sense of Romans 3 and 4, he never just comes out and says it, and he never explains how to fix it. Instead, he writes to Christians about how they ought to live God's word out in their lives, being quick to listen, uh, focusing on the, the, the law that you should love your neighbor as yourself to illustrate and make his points. And it's serious business. It's going to save our soul life. Our life, a life lived rich toward God, can translate into eternity in the form of uh, the inheritance or the rewards, a positive verdict, a positive vindication by Christ of a life well lived, and he gives a reward to us. Um, James's warning to readers and to us is that our failure to do so, our failure to live out God's word, our being a hearer and not a, a doer, is going to have consequence when we give an account to ourselves before Jesus Christ. Well, if you want to do a more of a deep dive through James and you've never done that, I do have a resource here on the screen that's available on Amazon. It's called Enduring Storms. It's a little commentary on James. And some of the things I could just touch on quickly, like these other verses about Bama judgment and that sort of thing, you, you'll find more detail there. Uh, may God richly bless you.